Welcome to our audiences from wherever you are in the world. We're now in day three of intense discussions and negotiations that are happening no next door by uh, government and corporate delegations. So what is being discussed is new metrics and targets, uh, enforcement systems, and also systems of support for corporations to embed those new standards of operating. Uh, in fact, corporations are being asked to put sustainability at the heart of what they do. And what that means is changing in the very well set practices from um, entry level employees all the way to the board levels. But companies are people and most of us are still only very occasionally inconvenienced by the effects of climate change. So it's, it is very uh, easy to lose connection with what is happening out of sight. We go back to our comfortable homes, we uh, turn up the heat, we press a button to order any food delivery we would like and, uh, or any Amazon package for which we think we fully paid for um, with a click of a button. And the easier it is for us, the more we lose connection with what it takes to deliver that package, with the, uh, how the entire machine is working to satisfy our every whim. So what is, uh, what's the language being uh, used to deliver the messages to us and uh, to, to the businesses? Uh, uh, that's what we're here to talk about. So I would like to introduce our uh, keynote speaker, Stu Eisenstadt, who is a U.S. ambassador to, uh, formerly to the European Union. And as, a, as an undersecretary of uh, state, he was a key negotiator of the landmark Kyoto Protocol in 1997. So with that, I uh, turn this over to Stu. Thank you very much. It's a, an honor to be addressing you on the topic of art, culture, and music and climate change, and appropriate that I'm addressing you uh, from the Whitney Museum of American Art, uh, where there's a special Jasper Johns exhibition. And I appreciate you allowing me to do this uh, virtually. I want to congratulate Ann Pence uh, and Mark Nichols, who co-founded the Artica Foundation inspired by uh, Ms. Auerbach's uh, magnificent symphony uh, and who organized today's event on how to stimulate action on climate change, which is the existential challenge of our time, and to do so through art, culture, and music. Also, much appreciation to Pam Pearson of ICCI and her team for their work on the Cryosphere Pavilion. My personal experience includes leadership at a senior U.S. government level in dealing with energy, environment, sustainability, human rights, and climate change cha challenges, working with NGOs, serving on corporate boards where climate change has become a challenge. I think we can all agree that it's taken too long for us to recognize that some human activity, which dramatically has improved our living standards, has also created environmental damage, none more threatening than climate change. In 1997, as Under Secretary of State, I led the large Clinton administration uh, interagency group and was the chief U.S. negotiator for the path-breaking Kyoto Protocol, helped mightily by a dramatic speech by Vice President Al Gore. The U.S. and other industrial democracies took ambitious pledges to reduce carbon emissions introduce emission trading to facilitate cost-effective carbon reductions, to develop what we called the clean development mechanism, to encourage joint projects between industrial nations and developing countries, and to include carbon sinks like forests. The 2015 Paris Accords strengthened Kyoto, and I hope Glasgow will take us even further. But I also saw firsthand the real hurdles to deal effectively with climate change. Our engagement, for example, at Kyoto with developing nations, especially China and India, was tense and unproductive. They blamed the industrial world, with some justification, for creating the climate crisis and refused to take even voluntary actions to simply bend their curve of emissions. We faced also headwinds at home with the unanimous 95 to 0 resolution sponsored by Senators Byrd and Hagel, admonishing our Clinton administration 
not to submit a climate change treaty for ratification of the Senate unless we had commitments by developing countries. There was also substantial business opposition to dealing with climate change. Over the years, since human-caused climate disruption has become, unfortunately, a highly partisan and polarized political issue in the United States, many politicians, even former President Trump, continues to deny the science of human conduct and the dramatic warming of our planet. The success of countries in reducing emissions has frankly been highly uneven. While the U.S. has reduced the carbon intensity of our GDP growth since 1990 by a greater amount than Canada, Australia, Spain, and Japan, we have not done nearly as well as France, Germany, and the U.K. More generally, combined international efforts have fallen far short of what's needed to prevent average global temperatures from rising to dramatic levels with dire consequences for our planet. We've simply not yet transformed our complex societies to be truly sustainable. But I want to suggest to you that there is room for cautious optimism. First, for both reputational and bottom line financial reasons, momentum is growing very rapidly for corporate America to take climate change seriously and include in their business plans concrete measures to reduce their carbon footprint and to follow ESG guidelines to achieve sustainability. Organizations like the U.S. Business Roundtable, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, support this effort, which is a drastic, dramatic, revolutionary turnabout from past decades. I saw this positive change while serving on a number of corporate boards, UPS, for example, but also the BlackRock Mutual Fund Board, where BlackRock CEO Larry Fink has been a leader in steering what is the largest asset management firm in the world to make investments away from fossil fuel companies. At Glasgow, Microsoft is also making impressive commitments. The culture and values of private companies are changing, sparked, I think, initially by Klaus Schwab, the founding leader of the World Economic Forum. I've attended their annual meeting over the last 25 years. I understand Ms. Auerbach was there as well. Uh, and I have seen over the years the increased seriousness of pledges by the largest corporations in the world, most recently, not just on uh, paper, but dramatically requiring the measurement of their pledges by financial audit. The U.S. Financial Stability Board's Task Force on Climate Change-Related Disclosures and the recent proposal by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission for enhancing the rules of corporate disclosure on how companies are doing with their environmental, social, uh, and development goals will accelerate this private sector action. Just before Glasgow, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce called, for example, for final resolution, which they called long overdue, for action under Article 2 of the Paris Accords on how countries can monitor and verify their carbon goals. Second reason for cautious optimism is hopefully before the end of this COP26 summit, Congress will pass finally legislation reflecting President Biden's Build Back Better agenda, which includes, among many other things, $600 billion to meet his goal of U.S. emissions being cut in half by 2050, by far the most ambitious ever by any administration. These investments will make commitments to having communities be more resilient, to deal with frequent extreme weather and wildfire episodes, expand our electric charging stations for increasing numbers of electric cars, modernize our electric grids, support the manufacturing of clean energy supplies and more efficient uh, energies uh, in every industry across the board. The Biden administration will buttress this new legislation with regulatory action by the president on auto emissions, on power plants, and on renewable energy installations. 
A third reason for optimism is the substantial ongoing climate-related activities of what we call sub-national actors in the United States, namely states and municipalities. This is something very rarely recognized even in the United States, let alone outside of it. A 2020 World Resources Institute report just last year estimated that even the current commitments from states and municipalities would alone reduce emissions in the United States by 25% by 2030. Expanded actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by states and municipalities could go as far as 37% reduction by 2030 relative to 2005 levels. And that's even without federal government involvement. The Biden administration is seeking not only to ramp up action at our federal level, but to incentivize these sub-national entities. California is a great example. Our largest state, it would be by GDP, the seventh largest nation in the world. And it's taking the lead quite apart from the federal government and aggressively moving against climate change. A fourth reason for optimism is there's been a significant change in American public opinion about the seriousness of climate change and the need for greater action. We saw this, by the way, years ago when the U.S. public recognized the dire health hazards of the visible hole in the stratospheric ozone layer. And then a conservative Republican president, Ronald Reagan, a unanimous U.S. Senate, and all countries in the world supported the 1988 Montreal Protocol, which phased out the production of ozone-depleting substances and CFCs. And the positive results have been dramatic. Now, people are finally beginning to see visibly the impact of climate change. It's not just theoretical. The combination of historic wildfires in the West, droughts, not only in the West, but elsewhere in the world, severe flooding, enormous rainfalls, devastating hurricanes, dwindling Arctic ice, and rising sea levels are penetrating the public consciousness for the first time and making climate deniers seem like Neanderthals. A June survey last year by the Pew Research Center found 60% of Americans view climate change as a major threat to the well-being of the country and by similar percentages believe the U.S. government is doing too little to tackle the problem. That's a good sign. Now, of course, much more needs to be done. But when you start to see this change in public opinion, it will ultimately translate into federal government action. Now, this panel, of course, is acknowledging the role of art, music, and culture and bringing that power to bring diverse people, organizations, and companies together to make all of this happen. I have a personal experience here as well and how music and art can shape public opinion and inspire action. I'm the chairman of the Defiant Requiem Foundation, which has produced over 50 concert dramas in the United States and around the world, the next one being in December in Amsterdam. Inspired by Jewish prisoners in the Theresienstadt concentration camp who use music, culture, and art to provide hope in a hopeless situation. And we've augmented these by providing teaching materials to teachers and students to raise awareness of our common humanity and to combat today's bigotry. The National Geographic, to which I subscribe, has had a very positive impact by highlighting the impact of climate change in its cover stories and imagery. David Attenborough, for 60 years, has highlighted the wonders of nature, but also now more recently, how we're damaging our natural habitat. And I saw at one of the annual meetings at the World Economic Forum just a few years ago, uh, his dramatic documentary on uh, plastics in the ocean. None has been more important than uh, Mr. Attenborough's powerful documentary, The Truth About Climate Change, where he has shown us with clarity the rapid changes that climate makes in unsettling all of our systems and living species. So art, culture, music, as uh, Ms. Auerbach's 
magnificent symphony can inspire us to do more. We all have to work together at COP26 and thereafter to encourage and support our artistic community to use every creative mechanism like the new Artico Symphony to highlight the urgent changes that we have to put in place to deal with the dangers of climate change to our shared world and the benefits of dealing with it now before it's too late. Thank you for letting me address you remotely. I have to excuse myself to catch a plane back to Washington, but I am privileged to be here with you and with this distinguished panel. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your thought-provoking comments. Uh, the audience here is cheering you. I'm not sure you can hear them. Uh, so um, uh, this is a perfect uh, uh, stage for our uh, following discussion. To introduce it, I would like to share a short video. This video is on the story of Arctica, the symphony written by Lera Auerbach, uh, a composer, a pianist, a, a conductor, and a visual artist, uh, a true Renaissance artist, in fact. So uh, may I ask uh, the team to share the video, please? I started composing when I was four years old. I grew up in the city called Chelyabinsk, and the city has actually quite sad reputation for being the most polluted city in the world. Of course, it impacted me greatly as an adult, understanding the impact of living in such environment and uh, what it does to all of us. We can all talk about environment and the scientists, but what's missing in those talks is emotional connection. Together with Enric Zala of National Geographic, we thought of this incredible project Arctica. From the beginning, the idea was of a personal artistic journey to the Arctic and how it affects a person. It's very hard to imagine it until you are actually there. It's overwhelming, but at the same time, you also feel how fragile it is. You hear ice melting, you hear ice cracking. So how do you turn all this experience and impressions into a symphony? I wanted to incorporate some unusual instruments, drums made of ice. It's an instrument that represents air and drops of water dripping from ivy stand. Inuit culture is incredibly rich. It's an oral tradition. That's why I felt the libretto has to be written in the languages of the people of the Arctic. Something that I found that unites them is the figure of a shaman, Anga Kok. The solo piano represents Anga Kok and the choir evokes different spirits that help him in his journey.
Arctic as we know it is disappearing. It's melting at a tremendous rate. So the landscape that I've seen when I traveled there two years ago is already not there in that form. And of course the hope is that by sharing it, it also brings awareness and brings understanding that uh, something needs to be done to protect this wonder. Thank you. This uh, video, every time it evokes such a strong reaction. Um, but um, imagine if you were sitting in, this, uh, in the concert hall hearing all this, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a force of nature. But also imagine if you were physically there. Lera, you are a composer, but you ventured into the Arctic. Could you please share with us the story of Arctic, uh, how it was born? The idea of creating Arctica Symphony came from uh, my conversa conversation with Henry Gala, an explorer uh, from National Geographic. We met in Geneva and we were talking about Arctic. And Henrik asked, is, is, is there a musical symphony? that deals with the theme of the Arctic or addresses Arctic in any way. And I didn't know about any such work. So the idea came, well, it needs to exist. And of course, since then, I had to do a lot of research. And the very first step on this journey was to go to the Arctic and experience it in person. Uh, uh, you uh, cross paths, uh, uh, paths with um, uh, someone who is uh, from a completely different uh, works of life, uh, walks of life. Could you please tell us how, how you decided to uh, uh, collaborate? And more importantly, when, when you went to the Arctic, what is it that you heard and saw that inspired you to transcribe it into the symphony itself? Well, being in the Arctic, is extremely um, wondrous, humbling, miraculous experience. It's an experience of dreams. Uh, when you are there, the first thing you notice is how sound itself changes. There is the incredible sensitivity to sound. And if you hear uh, Inuit people speak, the first thing you notice is how soft and imaginative the language is. So just being in the Arctic is an overwhelming experience um, psychologically. Um, it changes you in many ways. It overwhelms you. One thing I did when I was there uh, was keeping a diary because I wanted to notice how the experience of being there changes me. Also, visiting people in Greenland and, and learning about their myths, their uh, culture, their rituals, their uh, music, their oral traditions, their lives, uh, it all opened a completely different world for me. So I felt that this was a life-changing experience and I wanted to bring it into the symphony. I wanted to be able to share to create this work with other people, what kind of miracle and uh, fragile and wonderful are. Um, Lera, most people think of uh, music and art as um, heritage, but in fact, art shapes the thinking and hence it it has the power to transform the future so uh, what how does this process actually work i think art is incredibly powerful it is um, essentially human activity art does not exist in nature in some ways art defines us as humans what it provides, it gives us a certain distance from ourselves. It gives us perspective through which we can learn about ourselves. We can experience life in its fullest. It actually teaches us how to see, 
how to experience the world, how to be fully present, how to be fully aware. There is a wonderful quote by Paul Clay, and he said, art does not represent the visible, rather art makes it visible. So what does he mean by making visible visible, if we all can see? What Clay means is it teaches us how to understand, how to be able to truly see ourselves and the world. It gives us a certain frame. Art creates structures, creates form in the formless, which allows us this very valuable perspective. And through this perspective, we can understand and appreciate present moment to its fullest. And we can truly feel alive. So art is indispensable um, and it, of course, uh, it shapes, uh, it allows different times to be in direct dialogue with each other. Just think of what happens in, let's say, concert hall. You go to a concert hall and you leave behind all your daily concerns. Maybe you don't leave them behind. Maybe you're still thinking, well, uh, about the problem you're dealing with. But somehow through being there and being fully aware and participating in actively experiencing musical performance, being active listener, not passive, not just allowing it to come your way, but actually being open and in a way co-creative to, uh, to this process, you allow the transformation to take place. You leave the concert hall as a different person. Uh, when this miracle happens, when this incredible dialogue of times. So just think about the wonder of it. You can be in a concert hall and you can listen uh, music that perhaps was written 300 years ago, yet it touches you, it bypasses your conscious mind and it can touch you in such a profound and powerful way that you may be crying. Now, why is, what's happening here? Music is, after all, just the frequencies of sound in the air. So why does it why does it affect you so strongly that you may be crying and not even knowing why? That's because it actually touches something within yourself that is needs to be addressed, needs to be released. It communicates to you in the very profound, deep way that transcends everyday reality, and it's extremely, extremely powerful experience. So um, art is this wonder that allows different times to connect. It allows to shape the future. It allows for past and future to connect into this very present moment and address it and ask the right questions. Art does not give you ready-made answers, and that's the power of it. So we as human beings, we experience the work of art in a very personal way, but yet it addresses universal, eternal questions that are profoundly relevant. So it exists in this very highly personal, individual, proactive uh, way of uh, approaching art and yet it addresses a uh, very important uh, questions and it raises and it allows us to um, dream beyond what we normally would dream about and in dream in dreams begin responsibilities it allows us to, to grow to grow towards the direction of our dreams to grow towards uh, approaching that maybe we wouldn't dare to approach. It gives us perspective, large perspective. Uh, it allows different timelines to connect. And it's essentially because it doesn't exist in nature, art only essentially human activity. In some ways it defines us as human beings. Um, Lero, when, I, when it comes to uh, experiencing nature, I dare say uh, we have just an ab abstract perception of it. Um, you had the privilege of going into the Arctic and actually experiencing it. 
Um, whereas most of us live our lives uh, completely separate from it and we rely on scientists to dissect it for us, to tell us about it in, 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 uh, uh, in the form of a scientific report. And even the scientists are physically removed from nature. And um, the business reports that uh, um, uh, appeal to our uh, uh, better selves, they are even a big further step removed from the nature. So what is what do you think is wrong with the language that is used to communicate the urgency uh, and the uh, need for action that needs to take place? Well, the language uh, defines our vision. And uh, there is a, um, something that uh, Lev Tolstoy said, I'm paraphrasing it, uh, but he said something that one of the first um, in essential condition of happiness is for a person not to lose his connection to nature. And I think it is um, very relevant today because in the Western world, we tend to see, we tend to see ourselves as separate from nature. So there is our world and nature is out there. So we don't necessarily see us ourselves as part of it. We see there is some distance, which is completely different, for example, from the world and culture and traditions of Inuit, where um, when you come to the Arctic, you feel um, how ridiculous it is to uh, attempt to conquer nature, this romantic ideas of human beings conquering nature, or in fact, our romantic um, and perhaps misspoken ideas of uh, saving nature. So the whole concept of saving nature is extremely arrogant because we're not saving nature. The nature will be absolutely fine, except probably without humans. So we are on the quest here to save humanity, to save us because we are the only living organism that constantly destroys our own environment. So it, we are on the quest to save humanity, not to save nature. We have to embrace the vision that, that Inuit cultures understood and understand uh, that we are part of it. We are, we are absolutely uh, part of it. And we are part of our nature. We can join our future and humanity. And I think it's a very important um, linguistic when we, when we speak about the crisis. Um, we are not on the quest, this romantic idea that let's, let's do good and let's save. Uh, nature, no. We are actually trying to save ourselves here and our existence in the world because nature will be there just with or without us. And I think we are all during these times, it's like Noah's Ark. We are together, together right now and uh, it's Im very important that um, we see ourselves as uh, part of the much grander vision. Thank you, Lera. If you can um, please stay on and think of a question for any other panelist, and I will ask uh, the others to do the same. And now if we can go to Miranda, uh, who is the director of the Climate Museum in New York City. And I would say that her organization does some groundbreaking work in educating uh, the population, in energizing, and uh, instilling the sense of urgency for um, a common action. So I would like to ask Miranda to please share how uh, her organization is advancing this mission, this difficult task. I'm delighted and honored to be here, first of all. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us and Katya, um, thank you for including me in this excellent program. It's um, very, very important to acknowledge and fully embrace the capacity that the arts have to bring the urgency and the tangibility of our situation forward to enhance our, our perception and to elevate our sense of ourselves 
and our sense of time, as Lyra was just saying. And another way that it's critically important from our perspective to mobilize the arts is that they create a sense of community and common purpose. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now. We use the arts in a range of different ways and the climate arts have indeed exploded across the scene. I'm having trouble advancing my slides. Bear with me for one moment, everyone. My slides do not want to advance, Katya. I apologize to all. I can share them myself on my end, or I can just say next slide and someone there can advance them. Let me know what works best. I can start by saying without the slides that in addition to Lyra's spectacular symphony, which we just heard a little bit of, the climate arts have just exploded in the last, I was going to say decade, but even less than that, in the last five years, there's been an enormous increase in the output across different genres. So we have symphonies, just heard, there's an opera that was just um, ran at the Brooklyn Academy of Music here in New York City called Sun and Sea. It won the prize at the Venice Biennale um, a couple of years ago. There's climate fiction, um, that um, uh, in, includes the book, The Children's Bible, for those who haven't read it. Um, I apologize to everyone. We have a beautiful slideshow prepared for you and I think we're probably working behind the scenes to get it up. Uh, and then of course there are visual arts and we have a couple of examples of arts that focus on the melting of ice at the pole. So another echo, Lyra, of your work uh, and three very different approaches, one a massive pastel uh, drawing that is hand applied touches of blue and gray by the remarkable artist, Zaria Foreman. And then of course the, um, the uh, great Danish Icelandic uh, artist, Olafur Eliasson, who has taken the approach to polar ice and its loss, which is a subject that uh, many artists explore across genres, um, has taken that on by um, if you could advance about five or six slides by bringing ice to population centers so that people can physically and emotionally engage with it fully. Um, and then there's an artist named David Buckland. That's the opera Sun and Sea. Next slide is going to be the novel, Children's Bible. And then next slide, there's Zaria. If you look at the area behind Zaria with the white canvas, you can see that what looks like it might be a high resolution photograph for a moment is actually a drawing of pastel. She's applying tiny touches of blue and gray. The next slide is Olafur's piece, Ice Watch, here in London. Um, and uh, you'll often see people just draping themselves on this calved glacial ice in, in photographs of, of this monumental work. And then the final example of an ice focus slide, David Buckland. I think one of the critical ways that art is a necessary tool in the mobilization of public commitment and a sense of public urgency is that it gives us, Lyra, as you were suggesting, this immense sense of possibility of human imagination of what we can and must reach for. There are other worlds and other futures that are possible and it's up to us to bring them into being. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so the climate arts have exploded and those are a few examples. Next, I'll say a little bit about why I think that this is so and why the arts are such a powerful mechanism for inviting people into climate action. And then finally, I'll touch on a couple of examples of our own work at the Climate Museum. So, in our view, the arts are built into what it means to be human and communal. And that's why there's art 
on the walls of some of our first homes. The arts as here at the Louvre can create a sense of shared awe or next slide, a sense of shared place. This is Anish Kapoor's um, cloud gate in Chicago. Try to imagine that plaza without that piece. It would be void, it would be empty, but there's a sense of shared place that's created. Um, next slide, arts can also create a sense of shared political priorities and understandings. So here, Kara Walker's A Subtlety critiques American white supremacy and patriarchy in a way that words can't and creates community around uh, tackling those painful ongoing truths. Um, next slide, another more explicit political mobilization of the arts here, Tomas Saraceno's Erosine being used to create a sense of presence for an indigenous protest against a new mining development um, in Argentina. And then finally, um, Yayoi Kusama's pumpkin series. Here's a monumental bronze pumpkin in Naoshima, Japan. Super pertinently for our, for our purposes here today, this pumpkin was washed into the sea by a climate fueled typhoon and the community of Naoshima rescued it um, and reinstalled it. Uh, so that's a story about um, loss and trauma and communal reckoning, community engagement um, and reparation. Next slide. Here are a couple of examples of our work in the arts at the Climate Museum, where we use an interdisciplinary approach that's highly focused on community building and justice um, to move us all forward. This is a collaboration with the illustrator and data journalist Mona Chalabi. She made a series of posters that build uh, fossil fuel media literacy and thank you, next slide, that mobilize a number of different community engagement techniques, including young people learning fossil fuel media literacy and sharing those, those um, teachings about the disinformation campaign that's been waged against us by the fossil fuel industry with members of the public. Next slide, to give you a view of the three posters, I'll just pick out one of the facts um, it was very difficult to distill everything that we learned from investigative journalists and academics in this area down into three posters with one short paragraph each. Um, one of the key facts is there in that first poster, um, a lot of people don't know that the term carbon footprint and the first carbon footprint calculator were introduced into the mainstream by BP in 2004 to keep ourselves to keep us, excuse me, focused on our own supposed individual guilt for the problem of the climate catastrophe, rather than focusing our attention where it should be focused on their business model and its utter unsustainability. Next slide, please. Another example of an arts, a public arts project that the Climate Museum has used to build public engagement with the climate crisis and its meaning. I think it's significant to counterpose to our work to with Mona Chalabi because this also outstanding artist, Gabriela Salazar has a very different voice and tone, but her work is profoundly community building. This piece is called Low Relief for High Water and it was just presented in Washington Square Park here in New York City on October 10th. And it consists of water soluble paper casts of the windows of her childhood home. And she, over the course of the day, next slide please, Gabriella disassembled the work and handed it out with a time and date stamp and a beautiful custom logo that she designed to members of the public who came and who then, next slide, were given the opportunity to reflect in Polaroid portraits of themselves on what home means to them. And often these messages included notes about the jeopardy of the whole idea of home, of a safe haven in this time of climate crisis, hence the urgency that you've been talking about, Katya. Um, and people also took the opportunity to send postcards to President Biden here in the United States and Senate Majority Leader Schumer, urging them to take aggressive measures on climate in um, legislation that's now before the, the US Congress. Um, next slide. 
in addition to those two examples of our work building community for climate action through the arts, I wanted to share some just straight up community arts projects that we've done very quickly here, a community justice mural that was painted by students at the International Community School in the South Bronx in New York City. A beautiful several days of learning about climate, planning the mural, painting it, and then a, a wonderful unveiling ceremony. Next slide. This was a citywide tile painting project where students and in some cases adults across the five boroughs of New York City painted tiles expressing what the climate crisis means to them, um, finding their, using their own creativity as a pathway into climate engagement and self-expression, imagining a better future, reckoning with the present that we face now. Um, and then finally, a, a, a snippet from a crowdsourced community poem about climate um, that we executed at New York City uh, Poetry Fest. Um, and what all of these, what all of these interventions have in common, um, if we could go to the final slide, please, is the conviction that together we can make a difference and that it's the public opinion that Stu referenced. It's a swell of support across the culture for aggressive action on climate and as well, I will emphasize of pressure on our elected leaders as well that will make all the difference. Without that cultural shift, without that sense of broad community um, and the urgency that underpins it, but also the possibility and the imagination and the aspiration that Lyra was referring to, uh, we won't get what we need. But if we can build that sensibility, we can and will get what we need. So I will, I will leave the presentation there. I'm again, honored to be here. Um, and as, as eagerly and anxiously as everyone else here awaiting news from the COP, um, I would say like Stu, I, I, I adopt optimism. My optimism is, is the stubborn optimism that Christiana Figueres um, recommends that, that we all take on. I, I think his cautious optimism falls within that same umbrella. Um, and uh, this, this, the, the better futures that we can all imagine are possible and we can come together and fight for them together. And the arts are an essential ingredient in doing that and in showing up for each other in that process. Thank you so much again, uh, my gratitude. Uh, for this for this time with you today. Thank you, Miranda, for your uh, really uh, tremendous presentation. I want to ask you a question for myself because I don't think there, that there is any that there could be anyone indifferent who walks through the doors of the Climate Museum or who takes part in your um, public uh, uh, public spaces installations. Um, but I would like to ask you what's the next challenge for your organization in terms of engaging with um, uh, all stakeholders, in fact, with the elected officials that you mentioned, or with the businesses who are part of the communities, or with um, other local organizations? What's been the progress there? It's, it's been fantastic. We have, we have very strong relationships with a network of organizations, some of them cultural and arts organizations, with climate justice organizations as well, with community-based um, youth organizations across New York City and indeed to a growing extent nationally. So that we, um, we're, we're, we're part of a kind of a Venn diagram of ecosystems within the nonprofit sector of organizations that do cultural work with a very strong civic um, and community action mindset. Um, and we also are, are building relationships with elected officials at different levels of government and engaging in direct advocacy. There's a limit to how much of that we can do within our tax status, but those, those limits are quite generous in the United States. And we take full advantage of that with postcards like the, the one that you just saw and in other ways as well. Um, and we're also just in direct conversation with, with some of those uh, officials in addition to that. And we have been in conversation with some, some private sector interests 
in addition to all of that, and are very eager to engage um, with all of those different sectors of public opinion as we embark on a project, I'll note, of scaling out. We've been operating in a seasonal space and in shared and public spaces for the last three years. And the climate crisis has reached a point, public awareness has reached a point, and we ourselves organizationally and in terms of our proof of concept have reached a point where it's time for us to scale out. So we're in right, right at the beginning of looking for a year round full-time home. Um, and that will enable us to engage at a much deeper level and in a more sustained way with all the different constituencies that you just named. Thank you, Miranda. Before we let you go, and before I introduce our final speaker for today, I would like to ask you whether you have a, a question for Lera or uh, Christina. Well, Lyra, I was so moved um, by your work, and I'm really looking forward to listening to the entire symphony. I have a question um, about your artistic process, because I just find it so magical that a person can take what was silence and create this beautiful work of art, of, of sound. Um, and I wonder, do you hear something first? And if so, what did you hear before you wrote Arctica? Well, I tend to, when I work on a large project such as Arctica, uh, I tend to do a lot of research and uh, I tend to be um, overwhelmed even with the research. I, uh, I, I go a little bit crazy about it. So um, after going to the Arctic, experiencing it personally, um, I did a lot of research on uh, Arctic myths, culture, legends, rituals, music. Um, I acquired a lot of, and from different perspectives, also from the perspective of the scientists, of the uh, documents of the first explorers, and so on. So uh, what, I re what I realized after going through tremendous research and that I'm ready to give lectures in the university about Arctic cultures, but I, I, I'm not ready to write a symphony. <laughs> so um, the next step for me was in a way to um, put this research aside and address it personally. So what stays, what combines all of these different information, impressions, emotions? Um, is there something that is like a thread that goes through all of it. So for me, it was, for example, very helpful to identify a figure of a shaman, uh, Angakok. And in Arctic, uh, uh, in different Arctic cultures, what uh, what is common in all these different Arctic languages and cultures and so on is the figure of a shaman as an essential figure of center of community. Uh, and uh, Angakok, who is Angakok? He is essentially an artist. He is a performer, he, he, he is a poet. Uh, and he is the heart of the community. And he travels through, in his meditations, uh, he travels through time, through space. He realizes that he informs the world. So there are many worlds, uh, all these quantum realities. Uh, in, uh, in Arctic, people knew about it for thousands of years, that we live in this quantum, they didn't call it quantum, but that there are, we live in porous worlds, and uh, the artist is someone who can transcend uh, this world and, and be able to navigate through different times. Communicate with different energies, communicate with different animals, different spirits. Um, what I loved is uh, this idea that through art, um, all the different questions and realities in, our, in the real world can be solved. For example, I was amazed at the tradition of uh, uh, song duels which is a conflict resolution technique in the Arctic, and it's amazing. So uh, how do you solve conflict in the Arctic? 
So in the Western world, you can take it outside and beat each other or hire a lawyer and have a lawsuit for many years. Uh, in the Arctic on ice, it will not work like this because, well, you cannot really beat each other because there are no hospitals and you become a burden of the community if, if, uh, if, you, if you can't function. So how do you resolve a conflict? The community gathers together and the two conflicting sides, they sing, dance and create, tell stories and ridicule themselves and their opponents. And whoever gathers most laughter from the community wins. So it's a conflict resolution technique through music, through dance, through uh, art, through uh, um, song, and through laughter. And I just find this, comp and there is a scene in the Arctic which incorporates this uh, in the symphony. Uh, so uh, I, I just found that there is so many this absolutely incredible, wise, imaginative ways that we can learn from, from these traditions that we don't really know so much about or don't talk so much about. And uh, so, so my creative process was, was to gather all this information to then to feel what made the most lasting imprint on myself and then find form that would be meaningful. This is why there is a solo piano which represents the figure of a shaman who travels through time and space, and space, who communicates with different spirits, spirits of the room, spirits of the wind, and so on, and the choir sings about those spirits. And we travel, we make this journey of different, different worlds, different spirits, and experience uh, Arctic through all these different views together with this flight of the Andoko. So that was uh, the next step for me was to find this form that could, that could communicate it. And then, of course, to um, try to bring a little bit of this magic, for example, the sound of melting ice. It became very important uh, in the symphony. That's how the symphony starts with the drops uh, of water. So we can feel, we can hear the sense of ice. The ice is used as a musical instrument, as a drum. And uh, um, uh, quite dramatically, because as the, as the percussionist plays it, it breaks. So at the end of the symphony, we left with a little tiny iceberg of an of a ice, ice drum. So to and the, to incorporate all these wondrous sounds of the Arctic into the contemporary symphony orchestra to be able to bring it in, so so we, we can get a glimpse of this um, incredible magic of, of of being there. And also part of my process was, as I mentioned, I was writing a diary, uh, and I was also doing a lot of drawing and writing, which I normally do when I work on the large. Uh, large projects, so I would approach the same theme, but from different arts, from from literature and from visual arts. And in a way, I say it, it's instead of going to psychiatrist. <laughs> I used, I, I use, for example, I do paintings and sculpture and approach the same theme as I approach musically, but through a different perspective, and it helps me to keep uh, this kind of fresh view or to see something that I wouldn't see if I would only concentrate on music. Thank you so much for that answer, uh, Lera, and thank you for being with us, Miranda. So with that, I would like to bring on uh, uh, our final speaker, Christina Borelli, who found the two organizations that shed light on the plight of critical ecosystems in the Amazonas and the Orinoco regions. And, um, uh, and uh, these organizations use art to help us uh, living uh, in comfortable cities to relate to what is going on, uh, something, uh, the, what's going on out of our sight. So, uh, Christina, I, I handed Thank you, Katya. I think I, I lost. Okay. Can you hear me? Katya? Can you hear me? Okay. 
well, hopefully everybody can hear it. It, it just kind of went blank. Anyway, thank you so much, uh, Katya, and, and thank you to the Cryosphere Pavilion for this opportunity to talk about how to create um, consumer awareness um, on the origin of products through art concretely. So uh, hopefully I can, I can, um, there we go. So I'd like to start off um, asking a few questions that build on that question, on that initial question that I was given by the panel. So how do we relate to geographically remote crises? How does art bring problems into plain view and how we as consumers are responsible for the plight of critically important ecosystems and might I add consumer products that are tainted by conflict minerals? And how do we cut through so much information and determine what is important, what is urgent? How do you raise awareness, catch the attention of the world that is distracted and is multitasking? I'm sure many of you have you know, a phone and a computer right now while, while you're listening and watching. So how do we capture um, people's attention? And how do you tackle the polarizing and divisive factors and the nature of a topic like climate change? So let's see if I can. Um, I'm having exactly the same problem, I think, as Miranda, <clears throat> that I'm not able to show the, the slides. Can you show them for me? Anyway, while you put that up on the screen, um, I'll try to take a stab at answering these very complex questions and to talk about a particularly difficult case, which is my home country, Venezuela, where a horrific ecocide is taking place in a very unknown area of Amazonia and where a dictatorial regime has done a superb job at fooling the world um, about its environmental record, uh, about its indigenous uh, Pol the politics towards indigenous people. And um, <coughs> to make matters worth, worse, they don't even allow people to go to the area and just only a handful of journalists from the area are able to, do, to go to this space, go to this region and basically risk their lives uh, to report on what's going on. And they're also terrorizing local civil society, like the indigenous people into almost complete silence. So in my country, the problem is all the more polarizing because a dictatorship has played cynically on the language of climate change, telling the world that they're doing environmentally friendly gold mining, which of course is practically impossible. Um, so none of the important environmental NGOs, you know, I'm talking Greenpeace, uh, Conservation International and so forth, none of these have openly criticized the Maduro regime, despite the fact that the ecocide that Maduro is causing is probably worse than anything that Bolsonaro is doing just over the border in Brazil. So if you can't see the problem, it becomes abstract and difficult to grasp. And such is the challenge of climate change in general, and of course, in the problem in, in my country. But also ecocide in uh, remote areas uh, such as the rest of Amazonia. So science and environmentalists rely on sophisticated technology, including uh, high resolution satellite images, um, to monitor and report. And so, that in itself is definitely taking this problem to an abstract and remote level because, you know, a satellite image, nobody really can, I mean, unless you've got the, 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 the technology and the knowledge, you don't know how to interpret a satellite image. So in 2018, I started an advocacy group called SOS Orinoco with a group of experts inside and outside of Venezuela. And we've been working for the most part anonymously, concealing the names of team members and witnesses due to the high risk of doing this type of uh, work in Venezuela. 
Our commitment has been to document and create an in-depth diagnostic of the region south of the Orinoco River and to raise awareness about the tragedy that's occurring and outline urgent measures that need to be taken to halt this disaster. So on the screen, you just saw a couple of satellite images. Um, if you can go back to that screen, it would be better. Yeah, so here you can see, you know, these are satellite images. Um, and I'd like to talk about how art has helped SOS Orinoco to make this very complex, abstract problem into something approachable, comprehensible, emotional. Um, so art, to me, and to SOS Orinoco has become like a shortcut uh, that also makes the problem personal. This isn't just data, facts, science, images. This is a problem that touches my emotions and my senses. So um, you can start putting the, uh, the short video while I talk, and then whenever it starts, I'll stop talking. So we started a collaboration with a Venezuelan artist called Ana Alenso in Berlin, and she um, did a, 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 um, an exhibit on this topic in the gallery vetting in Berlin. We're gonna see a little video about her exhibit, exhibit. And we realized that in order to mobilize the Venezuelan diaspora and the international community, okay, there we go, I'll stop talking. Fabulous, thank you. Um, so anyway, um, we wait, did this collaboration with um, with Ana Lenzo and put together this uh, amazing uh, exhibit in uh, Berlin and it happened during COVID. So that was interesting in itself. If we could see my next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about this art exhibit. I don't know if there was sound, I couldn't hear the sound, but I'll tell you a little bit about this um, exhibit, which was called What the Mind Gives, the Mind Takes. So Ana Alenso's exhibit 
deals with a connection between the wealth of resources, but also conversely the resource curse. Uh, in this case, uh, specifically gold and the crisis in Southern Venezuela and in, in the Venezuelan Amazonian region. So Ana Alenso presents a sculptural landscape uh, in which the mechanisms and consequences of mining are revealed as signs of self-destruction as and as an anthropocentric modus operandi. So you could see the process of gold and how um, it was, you know, how it's produced. And you see the exhibit, the exhibit demonstrates via an installation how a sluice box in a gold mine works, how satellites help to identify the location and the size of the illegal mines, how rivers and the ecosystems are polluted and poisoned with mercury. And one of the um, uh, additional products as a result of this gallery is this book, which is um, being produced right now. Um, and it, it will be published in February, 2022. So this is a book now called uh, What the Mind Gives, the Mind Takes. And it proposes an exploratory journey in the form of the book through the current conditions of the Venezuelan Amazon. And again, this is a collaboration between SOS Orinoco and a bunch of incredibly talented Venezuelan artists that are now living all over the place, including a Yanomami artist living in the, or the upper Orinoco. Um, <coughs> so there are activists, there are poets, there are artists, there are writers. Um, and all of this is being curated by Ana Alenso through a dialogue between art, research, science, poetry, painting, activism, and architecture, a collection of testimonies and ideas um, is woven. And uh, the book proposes a broad and heterogeneous vision of the ecocide that is happening right before our eyes. So shared values and beliefs are easier to transmit through art, as we've been hearing from our other panelists, uh, because we're transmitting the message through senses, through feelings. Um, SOS Orinoco quickly understood this. We're working with academics. They're incredibly uh, high powered. They're writing very in-depth, uh, lengthy reports, which are all available to the public on the SOS Orinoco website, but we understand that for the layman, it's difficult to read this. It's difficult to understand it. So we started doing videos um, that we publish on Twitter, videos of satellite images with music, um, photography, installation, and so forth. And <coughs> sorry, this is helping to bring uh, this, this, uh, problem, this ecocide, uh, to the layman. So can, if we could see the last, the next slide, I think it's the last one. Um, so how do you make this very abstract tool? Here we go. This is uh, an, an example of one of the satellite images um, that we have transformed into a video with music. And these videos, these one minute two minute videos have gone viral. We've had hundreds of thousands of views. They're all on our uh, Twitter, YouTube, etc. So this is our way of making consumers feel aware and more responsible for their share in the impact on ecosystems. Um, and <clears throat> we've tried to make this in a you know, sort of more approachable and comprehensible and more emotional. Um, in a collaboration with Digital Globe, which is this big company, commercial company that sells um, satellite images, they donated very high resolution images that are impossible for the layman to see, let alone understand, because we don't have the, 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 tech, the, the software on our computers to understand and interpret these images. Um, so SOS Orinoco geographers and experts convert these images into short video, um, videos that are then published on Twitter. Um, and they explain in simple language what is going on in this part of the world. And very early on, we realized that if you add music to these short videos, then people for some reason seem to watch them over and over again. 
And we've partnered with a group of young Venezuelan artists in Berlin to produce these videos. Um, also a, a longer documentary, and it's all available on our website. So in conclusion, I think um, the, what, what we have come to understand is that we need to inspire people to change the way they consume. Um, and they need to become interested in the origin of what they consume. So we're already seeing this in the food industry. You know, people all over the world, they want to eat. You know, they're, they're fascinated by farm to table restaurants and they want to go to a restaurant where they know that they're eating the local food and that sort of. So we need to do this um, in, in, in the same effective way in the clothing industry, in the jewelry industry, in the electronic industry, and get consumers to ask, you know, how are these products being sourced? Where is the gold, the coltan, the rare earths? that are being used for these consumer products, where are they coming from? How are they affecting the local populations and the environment? How are these industries affecting the local indigenous population? Um, and I guess um, one question that I have from the previous speakers is that, oof, okay. Uh, consumers, I mean, humans obviously are very attracted by art but they're also consumers. And I feel that both of these are at odds. You know, the, the me as a, as a consumer of art uh, and me as a plain consumer, I have conflicting motivations there. So I think that art can inspire people to change behavior by coming together and, and awakening a whole different set of emotional drivers and values. Um, but we also need to affect humans as consumers. Could we bring Lera up? Well, I, um, I think that the power of art, and by art I mean all all, all different arts, music, uh, literature, visual art, is that it in addresses us as humans. So <laughs> consumers are humans. Uh, we cannot separate these two things. So um, I think uh, it what what it helps is per perhaps to realize art gives us this uh, perspective um, that makes us aware, for example, that uh, the danger of, of greed, of being greedy as uh, one of the uh, driving forces of uh, our civilization, for example, of constantly getting more and more and more and more. So uh, what art gives us is this ability to ask the right questions and have certain perspective. Uh, where does it lead us? Where where does constantly striving for more lead us? Where does it lead our uh, planet? What does it mean? Um, so I think the power of the arts, not that it can give us ready-made answers, but it can lead us to ask ourselves the right questions, which is far more valuable. Because if we are able to formulate this, we, we, we talk, spoke a little bit about the importance of uh, language, linguistics. How do we formulate uh, the issues we are dealing with? What language do we use? Because language, in a way, defines our vision, defines our future, the, ch the choice of the language. So what art allows us to do is to have this perspective from outside. Uh, it can uh, um, give us a glimpse of direction of, by asking the right question, by uh, by uh, addressing it in the form of art is a language, is a form of language, just uh, music is a form of language. So I think it's actually quite a larger uh, purpose. So uh, the question of uh, being consumers is only one part 
of maybe uh, larger uh, lar larger issues that we are dealing with right now. But I think uh, that by um, the power of the arts, we can ask ourselves, well, where we are right now, actually, where we are and where are we going? And through this perspective, it can perhaps help us to make more knowledgeable choices because the decisions that we are making right now are crucial. We are, we are living in the, in the extremely crucial time. So, and I think that's why the role of the arts is uh, perhaps more crucial right now than ever, uh, because it's about our, um, about our existence. Thank you both Christina and Lera and um, all the other panelists who participated and we just want to emphasize this is that we're not talking about slowing down progress. In fact, progress continues, but it needs to be redefined in terms that are more collaborative with nature. And uh, uh, that requires changing habits, not just rhetoric, but actually habits and reflexes that have long been set in us. And that can uh, only be triggered somewhere in the depth of the human being. And that's why we believe the art is an, a very indispensable tool in, in this whole uh, challenge we face. So with that, I would like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Anne Pants, who, um, is a, uh, who used to be a uh, climate negotiator on behalf of the US government to wrap up this panel. Thank you. Everyone who's with us here has been extremely patient. And I hope, despite our technical difficulties, you've enjoyed sort of hearing diverse perspectives of people who are creative. Um, that's kind of their modus operandi. And you might wonder, what is somebody who used to be a climate negotiator? I'm an economist. What am I doing associated with a panel on how art and culture might help raise awareness and help us deal with climate change? Um, I did actually work with Stu Eisenstadt, too. So I was in that world for well over 20 years. Uh, I was in the U.S. government, then I was in the private sector working with people on climate change issues, too. And as we all know, progress is too slow. And it's very difficult for people who are, you know, sort of technical negotiators. We do worry about language. Every single word matters, but we don't always use emotional language. In fact, oftentimes we try very hard to avoid that and just strip it all down to, you know, facts and, and analytical arguments. And, you know, we do try to understand the interests of others. And we very much, the people that I worked with, including Stu, always cared about the impacts on people. That's what drove us. I never slept for maybe 10 years. And, uh, but you know, it doesn't show, right? Because I was impassioned about trying to get results, but it was hard. People didn't trust each other, you know, across uh, country groupings, you know, whether it was North, South, East, West, we just didn't fully believe that we would all yoke up together and get the job done on this thing. So uh, my colleague Katya and I and Lara and some others, we started a new Arctica Foundation and it draws its inspiration from Lara's uh, wonderful symphony. But the idea behind it is that regular people not only need to understand, and I think what we've been focusing on primarily today is understanding its negative impacts. What, what are we doing as humans and businesses to drive climate change. But another element of this, I think, in my experience as a person who did policy for well over 20 years, is people lack the imagination when they're living in a situation to see the solutions to things. And I think that's another role. Like I became, and I always was actually, a total nerd about science, about technology, about how energy works, about you know natural systems and so on, because I felt like I would be ill-advised to start telling other people what to do or to negotiate if I didn't understand those things. And one of the things that was most powerful to me was when someone could say to me, you know what, we think we may actually have a solution for some of those things. And we're working across international boundaries and in public-private partnerships and with NGOs or civil society groups to try to advance and make you know, accessible to the rest of the world those kinds of solutions. So one of the things about art that I think makes that more possible 
is it requires us to have imagination, right? And when you're in the middle of a bad situation, I know, because I've been working on climate change since the 90s, right? So you know that people tend to get overwhelmed and think, this is a problem that is so complex, so intractable, and so seemingly unstoppable. You know, it seems to be like one of those giant snowballs you see in the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark that's coming down, you know, and is going to land on you and there's nothing you can do about it. But the truth of the matter is, I think art also has the power to inspire us that there is hope. And what I hear from a lot of people who are a lot younger than I am, they're like, well, you guys basically left us with this mess. You didn't take care of it when you had the opportunity to. And now we've got to do drastic things. So part of the narrative around climate change is that it's, oh, we're going to have to give up everything. And it's going to cost so much to take care of it. And as an economist, I recently actually wrote a piece that said, not really, because there are these incredible you know, innovations and creative people and creative groups and academic institutions, they are coming up with really amazing, interesting, kind of unbelievable solutions to this. And I think not only can art enlighten us with regard to how climate change is currently impacting, you know, sensitive ecosystems, indigenous peoples and, and places, but it can remind us that dealing with it not only is possible, but doesn't just require us to give things up. We can actually have not just a more healthy natural environment, but better lives. Maybe we can have more communal experiences, maybe music and you know some of these things. I always say to people, I don't actually need another t-shirt. I, you know, maybe that's where I'm gonna spend my time on Friday. I'll go find another t-shirt to buy. But the reality is I feel better if I'm in community with others. And, you know, we're doing something that's meaningful to us, even if it's just having a good conversation over a cup of coffee. So, you know, part of what I say, people say to me as an old economist, oh, markets don't deliver good things for humans. I was like, well, you know, humans need to demand of markets what it is they think will make them feel better whether it's good health care, whether it's exercise, whether it's being out in nature. I happen to be from Oregon, so I actually grew up very close to nature and I was a farm girl. So I was you know, intimately familiar with it in all its glory. Um, so this Arctica Foundation that we've started, I want to encourage you to join with us. You'll be able to find more information about it at arctica.foundation. And we're hoping to do things like um, take Lara Symphony around the world, wherever countries, like the Arctic countries, many of them want us to host it there, but not just do a symphony, which is incredible, but use it as a platform to hold conversations with people about the science, which can be wondrous as well, positive and negative, um, to include other kinds of creative activities, to bring together not just you know, artists and NGOs and people like me who left government so I could do this sort of fun stuff, but also companies, technology experts, and people who can give us some stories, some creative insight, maybe through the arts themselves, as to how we can solve these problems. We want to be able to do a grant-making program with artists so that we can encourage, you know, some of the kinds of things that Miranda was talking about and Christina was talking about, and of course, Lara, um, so that we can encourage artists who want to express themselves through their arts to give us some of these positive and negative messages about climate change in any form of artistic expression that they may be interested in doing. Um, so we will do that. We're also gonna establish strategic partnerships with any organization that we think you know has a shared interest with us and we're gonna welcome all of you to join us. So I know it was long, I know we had technical glitches, but we're really glad you're here. And the whole point of this Arctica Foundation is to bring us together, bring us outside of our political affiliations, our national affiliations, and whatever predispositions we may have so we can hear each other and get more of an understanding of what's really going on. So, you know, as Al Gore once said, so we can face inconvenient truths and figure out what to do about them. So we really look forward to you joining us and we're really hopeful about the outcomes of the COP and uh, we hope you have a wonderful time here and that you see some progress. Thank you all. Thank you.